Growing up, we did not go to church. We didn't go to church on Easter or Christmas. In high school, I got in with the wrong people and you know started smoking pot and doing all that stuff. And then once our daughter was born, I told myself, you know, I should probably, you know, stop with the the illegal drugs. So I, I started drinking a little bit, dabbling here and there. And then it became more and more and more until I literally became a functional alcoholic. I would get off work, stop at the liquor store, buy a case of beer and I would go home and I would drink beer until the family would come home and I would do it privately, socially, um, literally whenever I had a chance to drink. I mean, my world revolved around, you know, when I was gonna get my next drink. Went to work every day. I mean, I was completely functional. Was never late, never called in sick to work, and went home and it all just started over. I, you know, I hit rock bottom. And one of the things that really stood out to me was the fact that I did not want my kids to see me drinking every day. August 9th, 2012 was literally the last time I had a drink and I never relapsed. You know, it's a lifestyle change. When I stopped drinking, obviously I didn't have a relationship with God. Been coming to Crossroads, I think about 10 years. And then it just became more and more got more involved and and just started helping out and it just you know fell in love with all the people and it's been fantastic i started to realize that even though i didn't have a relationship with god he already knew the path that he wanted for me me to be a better person a better man a better husband you know because my family deserved better uh, nehemiah 414 it says after i stood up I looked things over and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, your wives, your sons, your daughters, and your homes. We gotta fight every day to be a better husband, father, coworker. About a year and a half ago, I sat down with Pastor Tim and he suggested, you know, why don't you get with Michelle and try to be in a leader at CR and see where that goes. My heart and my passion is for seeing other men be victorious in their their struggles, you know, seeing those those victories in other people. So I just celebrated um, 10 years of sobriety. How many years? 10 years! It's a huge milestone, but it's just another day. You know, I still got to get up and go for 10 years in one day, 10 years in two days. The devil knows, you know, your temptations and he's just going to try and try to plant that seed. And, you know, we got to be prepared every day to go to battle. Recovery is not easy. There's peaks and valleys. If you have the support team and the people that surround you and with God, any, anything is possible. It's family. It really is. The friendships that I've made, it, I can't even describe it. I love stories like Ryan's story. How amazing is that? Uh, what we celebrate here at Crossroads, what we celebrate on days like this when we're celebrating baptisms all over the place is we're celebrating the fact that Jesus changes lives. And there is nothing better than hearing about a story like that where you see God is still active, God is still alive, God is still moving, God is still working. I, there is nothing better than that. That is what it's all about. And I want to walk through a story today that we see in Mark chapter 2 that highlights all of the different ways that we can celebrate lives that are changed. I love this story in Mark chapter 2. It's become one of my favorites uh, as I read through scripture over the years because you can see there's all kinds of different perspectives. There's all kinds of different seats that people are looking at Jesus from. And at the end of the day, when they encounter Jesus, Jesus changes lives. And I just want to encourage you to lean in today to what that looks like in your world, in your reality, in your encounter with Jesus. Has Jesus changed your life? Have you said yes to Jesus? Have you started that journey? Has he changed your life dramatically? And you need to just pause and celebrate and reflect on all that he has done. I want you to think today about how that encounter with Jesus that you have had changes your life 
And I want you to be thinking about how you can share that experience with others. Because again, I, I want to lean into this concept. We've got to be prepared and willing to do whatever it takes to be the people that bring people to our lives who are desperate for the hope of Jesus to him. We, we've got to be those people who are committed to connecting people with God. That is our mission. That's who we are. That is what we are about. That's why we our one church in multiple locations. Let's give a shout out today to St. Pete and Mishawak. Everybody join us in Nashville. Can we just welcome them today? I love what's happening in all of these different areas. And I, man, I was just able about a week and a half ago to spend some time with our group in Nashville. And Nashville, you guys are awesome. I, we have some amazing people whose lives are being changed by Jesus in Nashville. And I know that guys, you guys are probably surprised by this, but I've actually visited Mishawaka and Nashville the same amount of times that I visited St. Pete. I know some of you guys don't believe that. You think I go to St. Pete all the time, but I don't. It's equal. It's equal opportunity. Uh, but I would say, let's shoot for like a next campus in Hawaii or, you know, San Diego. Let's, let's shoot for that. Um, I'm kidding. But the reality is we're celebrating lives that have been changed by Jesus. And what I love in Mark chapter 2 is that Jesus is kicking off his ministry. Like today's kickoff Sunday. We're preparing for an amazing opportunity this fall to connect thousands of people to Jesus. But Jesus himself kicked off his ministry. And in Mark chapter 1, what you see him doing is he is recruiting his team. He's gathering his disciples. He's starting to preach about the kingdom. He's starting to perform miracles. He's starting to draw crowds. And he's taking time to be intentional about getting away and praying, spending time with the Father, making sure that he's got everything he needs to get this thing started right. And he started the kickoff. There's already a groundswell because people are encountering Jesus. He's changing lives, and they can't get enough of it. Jesus is starting to gather the crowds. And so that's kind of the setup for what happens in Mark chapter 2. He had been in Capernaum. He went away for a few days, and then he came back into town. It says this, when Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door, all right? So let's just recognize for a second, Jesus is in the house, Jesus is in town, people know that. Like, he is here, and because he is there, people are gathering around from all over the place just to catch a glimpse of Jesus, this one who is preaching about the kingdom, preaching about things they've never heard before, performing miracles that have never been seen. Lives are being changed. Everybody wants to be a part of what's happening with Jesus. They have to see this guy. They have to experience what's happening for themselves because they've heard all about it. They've heard all the testimonies. They're coming to see him with their own eyes. And so the crowd has gathered. The house is packed. The crowd's gathered outside and, and nobody can actually get to the place where Jesus is because there are so many people. And you think about that. I mean, there's moments in life where, where you experience the large crowds or something, you know, some spectacle that people gather around to see. But this one's different. This is someone who is changing lives in ways that have never been even dreamed about. And the crowd is so thick because they want to see what Jesus can do. And I just want to encourage you to think about that. Man, Jesus changes lives. And the first group I want to kind of highlight today is the crowd. These are people who are gathering around to see what this Jesus is all about. They've heard about who he is. They've seen what he can do. They want to see how that applies to their lives. And I want to encourage you today. There is a crowd that has gathered around to see what Jesus is about, to see what he can do. There's a crowd in your life. Let me, let me say this very clearly. If you have said yes to Jesus, if you are following him, if you are allowing that light to shine in your life, Jesus is alive in you. People see Jesus in you, and there's a crowd that's gathered, and they're watching you. You have the opportunity to point people to Jesus. I want you to think about the responsibility that that carries, the weight of that responsibility. I want you to think about the opportunity that you have to be a light that shines that could draw a crowd and point them to Jesus. Think about that incredible opportunity, that incredible responsibility that we have. Wherever Jesus is, there's a crowd because Jesus changes lives. Well, let's keep going on. There's a crowd. We've established that. Well, here's what it says in verse 2. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. This is 
awesome. You guys, if you don't have friends like that, get friends like that. I love it. I love it. So think about this for a second. Put yourself in the position of Jesus. The crowd has gathered. It's a packed house. There's no room for anyone. There's people out in the streets. They're just hoping for a glimpse. Jesus is preaching about the kingdom. And all of a sudden, like you hear the scratching on the roof. All of a sudden, the dust begins to fall. Little chunks of tile and whatever it is are falling around you. Like, what is happening? Like, I'm used to the crying babies. Typically, there's a cell phone once every six services. I got this. We can, we can figure this out. But someone like, pulling apart the roof above you, like a little, you know, piece of sheet metal falling down in front of you, like, what's going on? Ah. That'd be my response. Ah. I don't know, I'm making up noises now. Sound like Seinfeld. Ah. <laughs> this is a big deal. This is a distraction. This is not cool. This is not normal. What's happening right now? But put yourself in the, in the situation now of, of this crippled man. This crippled man who has heard about Jesus Who's, who's heard about what he can do, who's heard stories about how he heals people and is changing lives. And you put yourself in the mindset of this, of this man who is crippled. And in that culture, make no mistake, if you are crippled, man, you, your, your future is not bright. If you are crippled, the only future you have is they, they'll take you outside the city gate, they'll, they'll sit you out there for the day, and, and you are begging for money from the people who walk by. That, that is your existence and at the end of the day, they take you back to your house and you live on whatever people were willing to give you. I mean, that is the future of this man. And yet somehow he has hope because there's this guy named Jesus who's been performing miracles and changing lives. And maybe, just maybe, if I can get to Jesus, he could change my life. He could heal me. I could walk again. I could be made whole. And so you've got this cripple who's, who's wondering what this is all about. He's never seen Jesus, heard the stories. His friends are digging a hole in the roof. He's getting nervous. All of a sudden, he goes from being total outsider, sitting out by the gate begging for scraps, and being lowered in this hole through a roof. And all of a sudden, he's in front of Jesus, like right in front of him. He's looking up, and there's Jesus. I mean, this is an amazing moment. Everything in his life is about to change. The anticipation, the expectation, the crowd is gathered around. He's in front of Jesus. And here's what happens. This is incredible. Notice what it says in verse 5. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. Which is an incredible moment. Face to face with Jesus hanging awkwardly in front of him on the mat, his friends on the roof going, uh, uh, Jesus, could you hurry it up here? He's getting heavy. Awkward moment. Jesus looks at him eye to eye, face to face, impressed with their faith. Never forget that's what impresses Jesus. He looks at your heart. Your faith impresses Jesus. He sees their faith. He looks at the guy and says, hey, your sins are forgiven. What an incredible moment that is. And yet, that's not the moment this guy was hoping for. Can we just be honest? As, as eternal as that is, and make no mistake, that is the mission of Jesus. As eternal and as long-lasting of an effect as, as that has on this man, his eternal destiny, that's actually not what he was focusing on. I think a lot of times we fall into that same trap, right? We get consumed by what's happening in this temporary reality, and we get consumed by our struggles and our worries and our fears, and sometimes we forget that Jesus is focusing on eternity. He's focusing on my eternal destiny. And I think that while we get wrapped up in the temporary, Jesus is focusing on the eternal, and so sometimes we don't see things the same way that he does. The things that are important to us are not the same things that are important to Jesus because we're focusing on the wrong things. And I want to encourage you with something today. This might not be what you want to hear, but I think it's real and I think it's truth. I think that, man, after you look at, you, you look at the mind of God with the eternal perspective and all that he has done for us, I'm convinced more than ever that when it comes to moments in life where we struggle, where we deal with a hurt, a habit, a hang-up, where we're dealing with pain, where God is trying our patience, which nobody likes to grow their patience because it means you're going through a difficult time. But I think that when you're going through a difficult situation, I believe now more than ever, and, and hear me out, that God doesn't care as much about what you're going through 
as much as who you are becoming while you go through it. Can we just consider that for a moment? It doesn't mean that God doesn't care about what you're going through. He does, very much so. But he's not focused on the temporary. He's focusing on the eternal. And so I say again, he's not as concerned about what you're going through right now as who you are becoming while you go through it. Because he's trying to take you out of this mindset of the temporary and focus on the eternal. And, and make no mistake, God loves you with an extravagant love. When your heart breaks, it breaks the heart of God. He cares deeply about the situation you are facing. But he's the one who loves your soul. He's the one who has your eternal destiny in mind. And he cares about who you are becoming while you wait. And so how we respond in those moments of adversity and of trial when we're walking through the valley, we can't forget that God is with us. He sees so much farther down the road of life than we do. Think about it as a parent when you're trying to uh, discipline your child. You know, hey, don't eat just dessert or you're going to, you know, blow up and you're not going to be healthy. You're going to get sick and it's going to be crazy. And, and you take the dessert away from your kids. What happens? They cry and they, I mean, I cry when they take dessert from me still. I mean, come on now, let's be real. But if all you ate was dessert, it would be terrible. You'd have diabetes by the time you're eight. You can't do that. Um, and the kid's like, I want the chocolate pie, whatever. The parent takes it away because they know it's best for them. And they think about just how, you know, as simple of an illustration that is, think about how much wiser God is in, in terms of our eternal destiny. He knows more than we do. He sees farther down that road that we can. And while sometimes we don't understand what's happening, we have to constantly trust, we have to have faith that God knows what he's doing, that he's in charge. And so again, Jesus is impressed by their faith. They lower their friend in front of him. The friend looks at him. This guy who's crippled looks in the eyes of Jesus, hoping to be healed, and he hears, son, your sins are forgiven. An amazing moment, but not the moment he had been pray praying for and planning for. So here's what it says. But some of the teachers of religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. You have the people, mind you, the room was crowded. Nobody could get in. These people were in the front row. And what were they doing? They were the critics, all right? Never forget, there's always haters, all right? There's always your biggest cheerleaders, and there's always your biggest haters. And the people that are cheering you on like, you're the best. You're the greatest at what you do. You are awesome. And then there's the haters saying, you're terrible. You'll never amount to anything. You can't listen, you know, just exclusively to either one of those voices. Remember that. You, you actually live somewhere in the middle there, all right? Just remember that. Jesus, the people who are in the room, who he is preaching about the kingdom to, are actually his biggest critics. These are the Pharisees. These are the teachers of religious law. They were in front of Jesus, and all they could do was criticize. I mean, think about all that they're seeing. They're seeing the miracles. They're hearing the teaching of the kingdom. They're in the presence of Jesus, and all they're willing to do is criticize and be critical of what Jesus is doing. So when Jesus says, son, your, your sins are forgiven, they're going, wait a second. He can't say that. Only God can say that. Pfft, come on. And so Jesus takes this opportunity to do something extraordinary. It says Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up, pick up your mat and walk? That's a difficult moment for them to answer, right? Because both of those things are seemingly impossible. But Jesus says, so I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man who's still hanging awkwardly in front of him and said to him, stand up, pick up your mat, go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. What an incredible moment that is. And why is that incredible? It's because Jesus changes lives. Jesus can do the impossible. As you struggle with your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups, I want you to know that Jesus is the one who gives us victory. Jesus is the one who goes before us. He walks with us. He doesn't leave us. He doesn't forsake us. He is the one who can change everything. And I want to encourage you today, man, whatever you're facing, whatever you're dealing with, man, Jesus can give you the victory because Jesus changes lives. I would encourage you today, if you're struggling, if you're trying to figure out what's my purpose, what's my, what's my identity, what's my life going to be about, what's my eternal destiny, I want to encourage you today, take this opportunity to say yes to Jesus because Jesus changes everything. 
But before we close, I do want to highlight one other group of people in this story that we kind of skipped over. Someone very important. Is there anyone that we missed in this story? Anybody have any ideas of who we missed? We've talked about uh, the crowd. We talked about the cripple. We talked about the critics. I think that final group that we can't miss is the crew. We got these four guys, these friends, that brought this guy to Jesus. Now, we, we have to circle that, right? We cannot miss this. Can we read these verses again, verses 3, 3 and 4? It says, while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. That was intentional. Those were four friends that said, hey, we love our friend. We got to get this guy to Jesus. Think about that mindset. Think about living with that intentionality. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. They ran into obstacles. It wasn't easy. But what did they do? They dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. You guys, I'm going to say this again. You need to have friends like that. Not only do you need to have friends like that, we need to be those friends. Are you with me? We need to be those friends. You guys, whatever it takes, be the person that gets your friend to Jesus. That's how God uses you to lead people to this moment where we celebrate changed lives. We can be those people that bring our friends to Jesus. And I want to encourage you today. We're in a season of ministry here at Crossroads where I believe lives are about to be changed. I think we're on the edge of revival. You just see the seeds that are being planted. You see the things coming together behind the scenes. You, you see the battles that are taking place spiritually. The devil knows that God is up to something and he's fighting tooth and nail to get a foothold, to get a stronghold in our lives, to do anything he can to keep us from moving forward. But I'm telling you guys, we're on the edge of revival. We're on the edge of a lot of lives being changed by Jesus. And we are in a season where crossroads, we can be a part of something special. If we are just willing to be obedient, to step up and be those friends that do whatever it takes to get that person in our life who's desperate for hope, get that person to Jesus. You guys, we're playing our part. God will do the rest. I want to encourage you today, don't miss an opportunity that God gives you to be that friend who brings someone to Jesus. There are people surrounding us who are desperate for this hope now more than ever. Guys, don't be shy. Don't be timid. Act with a sense of urgency. Do whatever it takes. Let's be those friends that bring our people to Jesus. Listen to me. If you're here today and you've been on the edge, you've been wondering about Jesus, trying to figure out what this looks like in your life, and you're realizing, I need to say yes to Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity to do that today. We do this every week at Crossroads. We do this for a reason. I don't want to assume that everyone here has a relationship with Jesus. I want to assume that there's a few people here who don't. And I want to invite you in this moment to take this first step in your faith and let Jesus change your life. So Crossroads, can we stand together in this moment? And can we invite those who need to say, Jesus, say yes to Jesus for the first time to say this prayer together with us that to, together we can affirm we need Jesus. Let's say this prayer together. Jesus, I need you. I believe you are the savior of the world, that you gave your life to forgive my sins, and that God raised you from the grave so that I could have eternal life. Thank you for loving me. I am saying yes to you, Jesus. Come into my life. I will follow you. Amen. And can we give him the praise and glory because he is worthy. There's no one like him. Jesus is the one who changes lives. That's what we're celebrating today. And as we prepare to celebrate change lives through baptism, I again, I just, I want to finish where we started today. I want to encourage you to think about how has Jesus changed your life? Who in your life is desperate for their lives to be changed by Jesus? Let's all be committed to giving as many invitations as we can to a changed life, to stay on mission, to stay on focus. This fall season, as we kick off a new season of ministry, you guys, let's get ready to celebrate hundreds, thousands of lives who are changed because they were invited to say yes to Jesus. We're going to begin uh, to make this shift to celebrating baptism here in a moment. And I just want to encourage you today, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate in a big way. Every time someone is baptized, let's celebrate like, what are we going to say today? Maybe that the Bears might win, a, win one game this year. How about that? <laughs> celebrate like that. We're going to celebrate because at the end of the day, this is eternal. This is what really matters. So let's lean into these moments after we worship together and celebrate that God is still alive. God is still moving. God is still working. God is changing lives. Let's pray together. God, you are so incredibly good. 
And we just pause and say thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you today that we can put our trust in you, God, trusting that you see farther down this road of life than we do. Trusting that when we're going through a dark valley, when we're, when we're walking through a trial, when we're dealing with hurts, habits, and hangups, God, that you're with us, that you love us, that you're faithful, and that you'll get us through it. God, help us to focus on who we are becoming, God, while we walk through that valley to make sure that we're staying focused on eternity and not just distracted by the temporary. God, may we be focused on you, focused on the people in our lives who are desperate for you and be willing to be those people who invite those friends in our lives who are desperate for hope in you to a changed life. God, we love you. We praise you today. We pray this in your name. Amen.